Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton. And today I want to show you another project that I've been working on. It's called Chasing Chaos. And it's very much aligned with the mission of Beyond Well, where we explore our interior lives. Chasing Chaos, real people and real stories about the challenges of mental health. Take a listen and let us know what you think. Here we go in three, two, one. Welcome to Chasing Chaos with Sheila Hamilton. Tonight's guest, author and former host of Live Wire Radio, Courtney Hommeister. Now, please welcome your host, Sheila Hamilton. Hello and welcome to Chasing Chaos. I'm your host, Sheila Hamilton, and we're here to provide well-being tools, resources, and some genuine answers to take command of your life. And I am thrilled to introduce today's guest and learn how she's managing through the anxiety and the lasting effects of 2020. She's a writer, performer, teacher, editor, playwright, and phenomenal screenwriter. For nine years, she was the host, head writer, and co-producer for Livewire, a nationally syndicated public radio variety show that records here in Portland, Oregon. And her memoir, OK, Fine, Whatever, is the story of her attempt to become braver by spending one year doing all of the little things that scared her. Among those experiences, a fellatio class, an afternoon in a sensory deprivation tank, a session with a professional cuddler, and going on 28 first dates. Please welcome Courtney Hammeister. Courtney, it is so good to see you. I'm so curious what music is getting you through COVID. Well, there's a couple things. So um, the music that really calms me is Patty Griffin, anything by Patty Griffin. Um, mm, she's just love. a stunning, gorgeous songwriter. And um, her music is always really calming to me. So I tend to listen to her whenever I need that. But also, I've become addicted to TikTok during uh, during oh, yeah. the pandemic, and the music on there is fantastic, you know. And so it's and it's actually because I'm a woman of a certain age. I'm not down with the latest, <laughs> Sheila. I'm generally <laughs> not down. But but if you, when you listen to TikTok, you get to actually listen to all these amazing musicians in one minute or fifteen second snippets. And so yeah. I have been listening to like Lizzo and you know just some of, some of the the newer artists. Just go to TikTok and you'll hear the same song over and over again until you can't possibly uh, yeah. listen to it one more time. Until it's memorized in your brain. <laughs> exactly. And and shocking that the TikTok users were like, this Fleetwood Mac, who is this band? And where do I they know. play? <laughs> and where can you exactly. hear them? Right? That was awesome. Yeah. I was just reading some statistics on anxiety right now, and two thirds of Americans now report severe anxiety. And I was just yeah. curious if if you could... Take us back to a story of when your anxiety was the most profound and describe what it was like in your body and in your behaviors. I have generalized anxiety disorder and that's, I think, that's sort of like a low, a sort of a low buzzing anxiety that is kind of with you all the time. And that I think people who are experiencing anxiety now for COVID who have never experienced it before, they can relate to, to what that feels like. I have also um, been diagnosed with OCD. And a lot of people mm. think OCD is really just about uh, compulsive behaviors like cleaning, washing your hands, that kind of thing. But OCD is really about intrusive thoughts. And, and, mm. and, uh, uh, and so if someone is doing a lot of cleaning, those compulsions are actually a way to fight those intrusive thoughts. Like there are germs everywhere um, and they're going to kill me. So I have to wash my hands a bunch of times. Another uh, issue I think right with COVID is I'm sure people yeah. who have OCD in, in that way are really struggling, but you can also have just intrusive thoughts and not have any compulsions. And that's what I had. I tend to, and, and so I had harm OCD where I was afraid that I had hurt someone or was going to hurt someone. Um, and mm. then I also had health fears, right? When you have anxiety, you tend to have brain fog. You have this increased uh, amount of adrenaline and cortisol coursing through your system, and it makes you have difficulty a lot of times accessing words. And so mm -hmm. because of that, I started obsessing that I had early onset Alzheimer's about, this was about five years ago. What that means when you're struggling through something like that you're waking up in the morning and you might feel what people perceive as normal for a couple minutes until mm. your body 
immediately like, <laughs> remembers. And, and, and so you have some sort of thought that leads you to think, I'm, I'm going to die of Alzheimer's or um, I'm going to kill myself before it gets really bad. And then mm. what you're living with is just a, a, a terrible sense of anxiety and fear, essentially terror, because mm. when you have OCD, those thoughts are facts. They are mm. not just an idea that is happening. And so imagine waking up in the morning and knowing that your brain is disintegrating. Anxiety lives in everyone differently. In my body, it absolutely lived in my chest. And what that meant was that I couldn't take deep breaths. You know, I tended mm. to, my, my, my breathing tended to be very shallow. Those who have had panic attacks recognize that when you have the symptoms of a panic attack, it tends to cause a panic attack. Right. Because mm -hmm. you're like, oh, no, I'm getting one. And then and mm -hmm. then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. A lot of times you get tingling in your extremities and then just a terrible sense of doom and weight in my belly that feels like nausea. Those of us who are old enough remember when television would go off in the end, end of the night, we used to call it the ant races. And essentially, mm -hmm. it's just this constant fuzz. Do you remember the noise that it used to make? Do TVs even do that anymore? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And on the radio, what that's called is interference. And yeah. that's what it does. That's what that mm. does in your head is it is an interference. It's a way to be, you cannot connect to thoughts. And so imagine if you're really struggling with something, like you just heard that someone in your family got a diagnosis, or you get a call from your doctor, you just got a, a mammogram. And you get a call from your doctor saying that they'd like for you to come in because they, they want to talk to you about it. That feeling that you get, imagine just walking around with that. And what happens then if your partner comes into the room and is like, do you remember, can, did I put my green sweater in a weird place? And you are needing to respond to them, right? But you, all that you have in your head is yeah. that doctor call. And so you can't even really remember what a green sweater is. I am so struck by this while, while I'm listening to you speak that um, that just living, that just going uh, and doing what we're doing today, which is opening your Zoom and pressing on it and making sure that your hair is combed and thing is such an enormous task for a person with anxiety because everything is above and beyond that feeling that you just described, those symptoms that overwhelming feeling that you're being sort of like taken away in your body. And here you are coping, sitting down and talking to us. An enormous amount of control is necessary to actually live a life with anxiety. Control is such an interesting word to use, right? Because you just feel completely out of control. So everyone is living with anxiety right now. Susanna Mars, who's a, who's a great local singer, performer, uh, and she has a podcast, and she interviewed me, and she said, you know, I just read somewhere that, uh, that the definition of anxiety is discomfort with uncertainty. And it was like, that's the, that's maybe the, <laughs> Hi, the COVID. best description I've ever heard. <laughs> exactly. And it's what we're all yeah. going through right now. And mm. I, um, in terms of control, like, you know, I initially and continue to a little bit just lost control. I, it turns out after I've been doing some reading, there are people who respond to anxiety by what's called overfunctioning. And there are people mm -hmm. who respond to anxiety by underfunctioning. And what I learned during COVID is I am an underfunctioning person. And, and so I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot of people have been posting things like, hey, can we normalize not responding to emails during this? Can we uh. normalize like not getting back in touch with our friends, even though we desperately mm. miss them? Because mm. as an underfunctioning person, you all you want to do... I. I have to tell you, Sheila, I have not in my life in the past, like experienced so many times when I have quite literally wanted to crawl under my desk. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mm -hmm. crawl under my desk. That felt mm -hmm. like the perfect response <laughs> to all of this. Like it just felt like it would be cozy down there and <laughs> like 
<laughs> you know, I just, I can't, you know what? I can't respond to your email. I am under my desk. I, I so agree with you. And I was looking, I always like to look at people's background and you have a very cool sign that says, this is some serious bull crap. And I really would like you to print that for me and send it to me <laughs> because I've thought myself, Courtney, that people who weren't reacting like that maybe have something wrong with them a little bit. I mean, honestly, I'm saying that in all seriousness, like if you right. haven't had a day or maybe even a week where you haven't come to some sort of existential crisis about who we are and how we're living, then I don't think you're paying much attention. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, and, and I think that, but, you know, I think self-delusion is, is a tactic, right? I mean, self-delusion is a way for us to continue <laughs> surviving in this world, you know? And so number and one so in I, Courtney's toolbox, self-delusion. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, but I think that that's what those people are doing It's well, it's either, yeah. as you say, they're not paying attention or they're not thinking about what's going on or it's a form of self-delusion. And I have to say like, so <laughs> My sign does say that, and it did say that. It's one of those signs that you see all the time on like influencers, you know, Instagrams, and they all like have inspiring quotes on them. And this is my version of that. This is my, <laughs> but this is, this is an under functioner's inspiring quote. Everyone needs to realize is there is no moral value to either of these responses. And I want everyone mm. to recognize that and have some self-compassion. Mm. Yeah. Your friend, I love that. your friend, you know what? She yeah, you know what she did in March? She bought a barn and she completely renovated it and she turned it into like a home for underprivileged yoga goats or whatever. Good for her. Yay for her. That's her <laughs> response to this. But it's not yours. You're a very different person. We all have various abilities to cope and there's no there's no moral value to any of them. I am with you, man. I, I honestly have felt like if we could have more of these conversations that people wouldn't be reporting, self-reporting such high rates of anxiety and depression. If we said this is the time where a lot of us want to be under our desk or not getting out of our beds and we are actually not accomplishing anything in the course of a day, maybe people wouldn't feel so guilty about the idea that they're supposed to be so productive right now. That to me is a skill to be able to recognize that I really do want to come sit underneath my desk and not do a lot today. It's actually a coping skill and I think it's a good one. But you have developed so many other coping skills to actually deal with your anxiety in a way that I think would be helpful for other people to hear. So could you go through some of those? I want to preface this by saying that I haven't dealt well with <laughs> in the past few months like i i have used my my tool set right um to deal with the thoughts as they come in but i have to say that i'm struggling and i i want everybody mm -hmm. to know that because i don't want them to think that i just i want to be honest about that i've i'm i'm still struggling every day through this so i think first of all the recognition that i was an underfunctioner and then starting to use some of those um some of those self-compassion skills like i think mm. i think if you struggle with anxiety and you are either an under or an over functioner then one of the skills that you can use is to reset your expectations or just mm -hmm. one of the ideas right is to reset once you do that then you're not constantly feeling shame right if you listen to all these people who are telling you that you should do all these things then you're setting yourself up to feel shame. Yeah. So I think that's a huge part of, of once you recognize that you're struggling with this is to reset those ex ex expectations and recognize and also reset the expectations of not only the people around you, but the people at your work. I think yeah. that you have to recognize there are some businesses that you're in where it's not okay to say, I need a mental health day. But if you're in a company that recognizes that, just letting them know, today I'm just really struggling and I think that I, I need to take a day and here's what, here's what my workload is and here's, what, here's how I think that it's going to be okay if I, if I do this tomorrow. What happens when you fight anxiety is that you tighten up your body even more and it actually makes it worse. So if you just, the first thing that I would say is to name it. 
So if, yeah. and, and you might feel dumb doing this, but just say it out loud. My chest, mm. my chest is really tight right now. And what mm. that does is, is it sort of takes you out of your brain and allows you to just gives you a little bit of perspective on your own body and also mm. recognizes that tightness in your chest is all it is. And it might not mean anything. It is mm. a sensation in your body. And sometimes we have no idea why our body does this, but the tough thing about anxiety is that our culture's always said, trust your gut, trust your gut. Oh, mm. your, your body knows, right? Sometimes right. your body doesn't know shit. Yeah. Anxiety is the ultimate unreliable narrator, right? Yeah. You, that's what's so difficult is that when you have anxiety, you can't trust your body. You can't trust, and you can't even necessarily trust your thoughts. And, and, and the thing is, whether or not you have anxiety, you can't necessarily trust your thoughts. We have about 75,000 of them a day. Most of yeah. them are meaningless. My favorite metaphor for this is a dog sitting at the side of a road watching cars go by. You have 75,000 cars going by. And I think that, that you've spoken to Anna Debenham. She has an amazing nonprofit in Portland called the Insight Alliance, and she helps a lot of imprisoned people to, to sort of get out of the, own, the, the, the prison that's in their head. One of my favorite phrases that she uses is your brain's special effects team. So you have a thought yeah. and it's just sitting there and then your brain's special effects team gets a hold of it. And it's, and it just, it just grabs on. It's like, oh, and you know what? This, 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 this is just like that thing your mom said when you were five. And this is just, oh my God. And this is, you could die of this probably. Your brain special effects mm -hmm. team grows it and grows it and grows it. If you, if you grab onto it and you think that it yeah. has some meaning. But if you're the dog by the side of the road, you could either grab on to one of those cars with your mouth and get dragged and be bloody, or you could watch it go by because it's, mm. it doesn't mean anything. Like yeah, boy, it doesn't awesome. mean anything unless you give it meaning. And that's a huge help for people with anxiety is recognizing that we are creating these stories in our head. Yeah, I'm the dog that would chase it going 90 miles per hour and never catch it and just follow it around and around and around like a greyhound and a rabbit. I'm not kidding you. That's what it felt like to me. To your point, Courtney, about I wish we could name it when when at the beginning of quarantine, when all of these people were in the stores and they're buying up toilet paper, I felt like yelling to the sky, name your anxiety, because really yeah. all of that hoarding, all of that doing, all of that bread making and all of that busyness was all about trying to quell anxiety. And I kept wondering, like, is anybody going to say this to people or is this the more honorable way? of dealing with anxiety. Of course our culture does that, right? It's so much better to do. It's so much better to get stuff done. You have to be productive. Yeah. You're yeah. applying a moral value to it. You know what's good? Surviving. Surviving yeah. is good. Like, yeah. j that's, and sometimes that's as much as we can do. Medication for antidepressants and anti-anxiety is up 60% in America since the beginning of COVID, 60%. So it is clear that people are really struggling. And I, I also think it's fascinating to me the way that you have eliminated a ton of the stigma around taking medicine to help deal with these kind of problems. So talk to people a little bit about the journey that you've had on just trying to find the right mix of medication that worked for you? Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm still, I'm still struggling with that. You know, I had a series of about five months where I was, where I was having intrusive thought OCD. It was about a year and a half ago. What ended up working for me was Prozac. And one of the things that we know about SSRIs that we talk about, the majority of the people who take them, it takes away their sex drive. I don't, I don't know if I don't, I don't know if that's being discussed quite enough. I think that it's something that people just agree to. They just say, I'm willing to trade that. Yeah. And I think um, that for me, because I wasn't sexually active until a lot later in life. And um, mm. I was a fan. 
And I yeah. think that we all are. That was really, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And there are some people who honestly, and so many women who are post menopausal can take, can take it or leave it. So for them, it's like, it's fine. It's, you know, it's not like anything has changed. I'm willing to make that trade. Like, of course I'm going to mm. tr- trade not being able to reach orgasm for yeah. uh, thinking that I'm going to die every day. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely yeah. willing to trade that more and more. What, what I'm really hoping that comes out of this situation and the fact that so many Americans are struggling with anxiety and more people are going on these medications is that the stigma of getting help and taking medications mm. will be taken away. You know, I keep talking about moral value. There are people who assign moral value to being able to deal with your mental illness without taking drugs. Yeah. Fuck right. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not to like, do swearsies, but that makes me, I cannot tell you how angry it makes me when anyone assigns a moral value to anyone struggling with a mental illness and who just needs to get by whatever you need to do to survive every day is, is absolutely okay. We'll be right back with more Chasing Chaos after this brief message. Chasing Chaos supports the bold mission of NAMI Clackamas. The National Alliance on Mental Illness is a grassroots organization dedicated to improving the quality of life for everyone impacted by mental health issues through support, education, and advocacy. One of the many things that makes NAMI unique are its robust classes and support groups delivered entirely by trained volunteers with lived experience. Join other generous folks like you who share NAMI's vision of hope health, acceptance, and the well-being of our community. Learn more about their life-changing programs and give now at namicc.org slash Chasing Chaos. I thought what you did in your book, okay, fine, whatever, you can hold it up for people, please, and so they can see the brilliant cover. It's so cool. I I wore it. A shirt to match. You did it really in a in a very comical way, kind of exposure therapy. You took things you were deeply afraid of and you immersed yourself in them. But I always wondered after reading it, was there an experience you didn't keep in? Was there something that happened that was oh. so uncomfortable and so weird that you actually didn't include it in the book? I think there was there wasn't um, because I I put in the weirdest experiences that I had because those were the hardest to, to write about. I think, I think that, um, I mean, that's the thing. It wasn't like absolutely insane, insane stuff, but it was definitely insane for a person who struggles with anxiety and like the, you know, the professional cuddler, I just don't like talking to strangers. So cuddling with a stranger was just beyond. And especially Mm. again, with a weight problem, that was really difficult. It's fascinating to me that uh, you went on 28 dates, but you also met the love of your life. And <laughs> I, I'm curious how COVID has impacted that love and that union, because as we all know, people are, are you know, saviors for our mental health. And they're also what exacerbated <laughs> madly. So how is that going? I have never lived with a romantic partner and I'm 52 years old. No moral value to that just just fighting that just fighting that thought um (laughs) or just no sort of value like you're not a freak it's fine you're not a freak so he bought this wonderful mid-century house and we moved in in december of last year and then COVID happened in mid-march and i was just learning to live with a romantic partner and here's what happened (laughs) is that I cannot live with someone 24 seven. I can't, yeah. I've just realized that. And I, mm-hmm. and, and this was some, this is again, something that I think, um, you know, if you, ha- if you have anxiety, I think that we tend to sometimes dismiss our fears or you're just like, oh, you're overthinking this and it's, everything is fine. Talk mm. to people, talk to a therapist, talk to your friends. I think that my curiosity saved me in this case because I did. I talked to a bunch of friends. And here's what I would like to normalize I would like to normalize loving someone and not being mm. able to live with them 24 7 for the rest of your life. Hey, you're here. And <laughs> I had this idea with a friend of mine who was also really struggling with this. 
and it was to to get an apartment uh, that we essentially all of the women who were losing their freaking minds timeshare. And, what? How and did was, I not get invited to this? <laughs> huh? huh? Uh, well, so that's bad. the thing. We we haven't we haven't done it yet. But but that was the thing. I, I and and the way that I that I talked to my friend about it, I was like, so I have this idea, and it's either genius or it's a harbinger of doom for my relationship. <laughs> and I I talk to women about it, and their eyes just widen, and they and they say oh, yeah. the same thing. They're like, "Where's the list? Can I get on the list?" But I have to tell you, Sheila, I don't know how many conversations you've had with people, but it was it was really hard for me to find people who normalized that. And we're like, oh, yeah, well, it's really hard. I come from a family where my sister and her partner bought condos next to one another. My parents routinely took two week breaks apart from each other just to say we want to keep our relationship fresh. I completely agree with you, Courtney, that these kind of realities have to be brought up. They have to be actually be, actually be discussed in kind of an open and honest realm. And it's not that we don't love the people deeply or they don't love us. It's just that human beings aren't meant to be together this much. We are not meant to be th together this much. It's funny because I've talked to my partner about it because I've said, uh, I mean, aren't you being driven crazy because you have no privacy or solitude? And he's just like, I'm good. Like he just, it's not something that he needs. And that's normal too. Like he, you know, he goes down, we have a basement. We're very lucky. Like we have an office and, you know, yeah. I recognize that. Like I recognize how lucky you are, but, but I cannot live without solitude. There's something about, and I think this speaks to shame. Um, I have a lot when I'm doing something that I feel like, like the TikTok obsession, some days I just want to like sit I just want to lie in bed and watch TikTok. And there are things that I do where I don't want to be observed. You know, like he'll pop into the room and he's like, hey, TikTok girl. And I'm like, don't talk about it. I'm so ashamed of, of it. I love that you brought it up, um, Courtney, because what it me what it says to me is that if you really cope with who you are in a really authentic way and you're brutally honest with yourself about what you really need to be happy, it can improve your mental health. It really can. And I think a lot yeah. of people have really terrible mental health problems because they're trying to please other people. They're trying to be in other bodies. You know, they're trying to yes. be someone they're really not. So I'm hoping that that resonates, especially with women who want the key to your damn apartment. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> I want some of that timeshare action. I have been curious to ask you this question since I've known you. Do you feel like your humor in some ways saved your life? I would say absolutely. I mean, I think that I think that it saves a lot of us. There, there are those of us who sort of have this. It's a it's a language that we have kind of with our friends, and um, mm. there are people that I've known who use humor to avoid talking about difficult things. But the people that I know use humor to talk more deeply sometimes about <laughs> about mm. things that are difficult. The wonderful thing about um, about teaching your brain to see absurdity is that oftentimes things that are absurd make us really angry. And to figure out a way to see ridiculous things as absurd as opposed to frustrating or having humiliating things happen in your life. Um, yeah. I feel so incredibly lucky that I have taught my brain to seek out the absurd in these stories and to mm. find humor in them because it helps me to reframe them and reframing we as we know right reframing helps us to look at our life in a different way and in a more mm. positive way and um you know and i always like say in my classes like you know if we believe that we are made up of our stories and we can go back and see a story in a different way and see a story in a way that feeds us better then we're literally changing our life, you know, mm. and that's extremely powerful. So I feel mm. like it absolutely has. I'm always just like completely moved after I talk with you, Courtney. Thank you, you for too. doing this you so too. much. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Chasing Chaos. Tune in next time to hear more stories like Courtney's and find genuine answers on your path to well-being. 
I'm your host, Sheila Hamilton, and I hope you stay strong. Join other big-hearted people like you who support our mental health community. Give now by clicking on the Facebook Donate button or visit namicc.org slash chasing chaos. Get the latest tools and resources to manage your well-being. Plus, learn how to keep safe, get tested, and where to be immunized for COVID. Visit namicc.org. We hope you'll share this episode of Chasing Chaos with your friends. Tag your posts with Chasing Chaos.